Michael. Great to hear you read again. Some of you may know Michael uh, was a co-curator of the 510 reading series in Hamden for how many years? Eight, Eight years. Yeah. Our next reader today is Matt Porterfield. Matt is the writer, director of three acclaimed feature films, Hamilton, Putty Hill, and I Used to Be Darker. His work is in the permanent collection of the Museum of Modern Art and has screened at the Centre Pompidou, Walker Art Center, the Whitney Biennial, and film festivals such as Sundance, the Berlinale, and South by Southwest. Matt made his first narrative short, Take What You Can Carry, in Berlin this past summer with a grant from the Harvard Film Study Center. His new screenplay, set in Southeast Baltimore, has received fiscal support from Creative Capital and the French Ministry of Cultures Sancho Nacional du Cinema. Matt received an Individual Artist Award in Media from the Maryland State Arts Council in 2006, the Janet and Walter Sondheim Art Skate Prize in 2011, and he was among the first recipients of GBCA's Ruby's Art Grant in 2014. Since 2007, he's been teaching film production and theory at Johns Hopkins University. Please welcome Matt. Try to, I have a really hard time projecting, but I'll do my best. Um, I, I've been uh, so uh, focused on um, the city uh, this week, I, I didn't figure out like what I, I was going to read until last night. And it's a bit uncomfortable for me because I'm not real, I don't consider myself a writer, uh, though I'm very honored to be here. I do write screenplays, but they're just sort of a means to an end. Um, the words aren't precious. Uh, hopefully they just convey some of the, some of the ideas and images that I want to see on screen. Um, but then I figured I should just read from what I've been working on for the last two years. Uh, this is the third, I sort of think of it as the third in a trilogy of films um, set in uh, the working class suburbs of Baltimore. Uh, the working title is Soller's Point. Um, it's the story of a man navigating the free world and the free market after a period of incarceration and six months home detention. The guy's name is Keith. He's in his, thank you very much, he's in his 30s. Um, and uh, uh, he's living with his dad in a community that's scarred by joblessness and drugs and entrenched segregation. And uh, so he's kind of pushing back against limit limitations, some, some endemic to his uh, socioeconomic reality, others self-imposed. Um, and, the, and the neighborhood, uh, which Deborah knows well, I was, uh, her, her Roots of Steel was a, a major resource. Um, it's a wonderful book. Uh, is, uh, in Southeast Baltimore, it's um, kind of relatively cloistered enclave um, on the literal edge of the land, uh, situated in a cove in a company town uh, on the western shore of the Chesapeake Bay. I'm gonna try to read the, the first uh, 15 pages or so. I, I don't know how many of you have read screenplays. Ideally, they're a page a minute, and they're specifically formatted. There's usually like a little information at the top of the page um, at the beginning of each scene that that indicates three kind of important pieces of information. Uh, it's called the slug line or the scene heading, and it tells you whether the scene is interior or exterior, or both, whether it's day or night, and then the, the location in which the scene takes place. So I'll, I'll read some of those, I'll abbreviate others. Um, interior Keith's house, bedroom, day. The curtains are drawn, air conditioning on full blast, the space is in flux somewhere between a teenager's bedroom and a prison cell. Every surface is tagged with graffiti, except for the blank squares where posters once hung. Three skateboards, cracked in two, are mounted on the wall like trophies. There is a PC on an old wooden desk piled with books and magazines. Boxes are stacked on the floor. Keith Cohill, 30s, enters just out of the shower. He is handsome, fit, with puckish features. Despite his youthful appearance, he is clearly too old for this room. He throws his towel on the unmade bed and slides open a closet door plastered with stickers. He grabs a pair of clean shorts and a shirt from the closet and gets dressed, revealing an ankle monitor on his left leg. He throws his comforter on the floor and tucks the sheet into the mattress with perfect hospital corners. Keith turns off the AC and pulls the curtains open. Living room. Keith checks the room's three windows. The first two face a courtyard. The third affords a view of the street. Keith watches four young men loitering in a group. He leaves the window, turns on the television, finds the local news, and does a set of sit-ups on the rug. Kitchen. Keith heats a pan. He pulls two slices of bread from a bag in the cupboard. 
He opens the refrigerator and finds milk, butter, and a carton of eggs. He drops a pat of butter in the pan and cracks an egg on top. The doorbell rings. Keith peers through the window above the sink. Two men in suits, Jehovah's Witnesses, wait on the stoop. One stands expectantly by the door while the other hangs back, holding a Bible and a copy of the Watchtower. The doorbell rings a second time. Keith hears the sound of a car pulling into the driveway. He walks to a window with a better view. A living room. From the window, Keith watches his father, Carol, 70s, carrying two bags of groceries up the walk. The evangelists try to start a conversation, but Carol dismisses them. Interior, kitchen. Keith returns to the stove. The front door opens. And then the Jehovah's Witnesses off screen say, have a blessed day. Carol enters. Carol. Cat food was 10 for 10, mix and match. I bought ground chuck too, 350 a pound. Keith, you want an egg? Carol, no thanks. Keith flips the egg, puts a slice of bread in the toaster, and helps his father unload the groceries. Dish soap, grapefruit juice, pineapple slices, instant coffee, powdered creamer, potato rolls, and a carton of menthol cigarettes. The resemblance between father and son is striking. Carol is one possible version of Keith's future self, still fit, sharp, but weathered by work and worry. Compared to Carol, Keith looks young for his age, but with the same focused countenance, not withdrawn, but private. Carol holds up a bag of grapes. You eat these, Keith? Sure. Keith unloads one bag, folds it neatly, and hands it to Carol. Carol slides it under the sink, then grabs several plates, three cans of cat food, and exits the kitchen. Keith places the toast on a plate and the egg on top. He pours a dribble of milk, dribble, sorry, drizzle, sorry, into a glass. Dad, no answer. Keith walks to the back door, eating his sandwich, holding a plate underneath to catch the drippings. Exterior, Keith's house. Carol's in the garden, surrounded by cats. He smokes a cigarette and spoons cat food into three small bowls. Light rock floats from the speakers and into the yard. Keith calls from the window. Did you get milk? Carol guards Keith. Come on, Dad. Carol, use creamer. Keith, I can't drink creamer. The phone rings. Keith returns to the kitchen. Um, here he makes three, he receives a phone call and then makes two phone calls. He receives a phone call from his probation officer. Uh, he's requesting uh, a exception to travel out of state for his niece, niece's birthday. Um, it's not clear if she'll grant it, so he calls his lawyer, um, and then he calls his sister to tell her that, that things aren't looking that good. I don't really want to read those phone conversations. Yeah. It's challenging. Um, so anyway, uh, when he's done with uh, talking to his sister, she asks to, to speak uh, to their father, so he uh, returns to the, the back door after kind of pacing around the kitchen and hands the phone to his father and then walks back inside, listening in to his father's conversation. I'll try this one. Carol. Yeah. Yeah, I have a meeting with a new sponsee at 10. It should be done by noon. I'll write it on my calendar. I'm trying to get organized here. Yeah, the 17th. Yeah, but he can't leave state. I don't know. You better ask him. Yeah, that would help. I don't know, Volunteers of America, he's, he's too old for job car. He's too impatient. Yeah, I know, it looks good for parole. Keith walks away from the door. He makes another round of the windows. He watches roofers on the building next door. He begins another set of push-ups and sit-ups on the living room rug. Keith enters, and now he's in his bedroom, sorry. He pushes through some books on his desk, a refrigeration and air conditioning technology manual, a record collector's guide, a history of the Illuminati, some graphic novels. He selects a sketchbook with eight and a half by 11 inch paper and finds a pencil. Back in the kitchen, Keith goes to the refrigerator and pours himself a glass of soda. He sets the pencil and notebook out on the table. He sits down and scans the pages of the book. Restless, Keith stands again. Keith walks towards the rear of the house. He looks out the window overlooking the backyard. Carol is still in the garden, no longer on the phone, now watering the flowers that line the shed. Keith opens the back door. Dad. Carol can't hear Keith over the sound of the hose. Dad. Carol turning. Yeah. Keith. Can you not talk about me with other people? Carol, what? Keith, on the phone, when I'm not around. Carol, I was talking to your sister. Keith, it doesn't matter. If she wants to know something, she can ask me. I, we talk, I, I just don't want people talking behind my back. Carol, we're not people, we're family. Keith, just give me a break and quit the gossip. Keith lets the door swing shut behind him. Returns to the kitchen, sits at the table. He tears a blank page from a notebook and begins to draw a picture of a girl in the manga style, big eyes, tiny nose, long hair done up in ribbons. Bedroom. Keith enters and begins to search the drawers of his desk. Unable to find what he's looking for, he pulls a magazine from the box and uses its spine to make two straight lines across the top of the page with his pencil. Satisfied, he sits at his PC and looks up bubble letters on the internet. In about 30 seconds, he's staring at pictures of cartoon bondage. Keith pulls up a free porn site and 
scans the thumbnails. He clicks on a link. A video of a brunette masturbating with a pink vibrator begins to load, then freezes. <laughs> Living room. Uh, Keith opens the front door and lights a cigarette. So he's on the, the sort of the, ver the doorstep here. Um, he sits on the door frame and watches the birds in the trees. He watches three boys in the street playing football. He motions to one of the boys to throw him the ball. Keith reaches out, barely catches it, and throws it back. A car pulls up and parks in front of the house. Keith's ex, Courtney, 29, gets out. A shy girl from a large family of boys who grew up far prettier than anyone expected. Most days, she wishes she were the middle son. Courtney lifts a box from the passenger seat and carries it to Keith's door. Courtney, hi. Keith nods. Courtney, how are you? Keith shrugs. She pauses. They're not fucking around with those shackles. Keith comes off soon. Courtney, when's the hearing? Keith, end of the month. Congratulations. Keith, thanks. Courtney, listen, I, I just wanted to say that and let you know I'm thinking of you. Keith nods, and I thought you might want the last of your stuff. Keith stands, he takes the box. Are my clothes in here? Courtney, I don't have your clothes. Keith, where are they? I'm missing clothes. Courtney, I don't, I don't know, Keith. There's a letter on top. What does that say? Read it. You can't just tell me? No, too hard. Keith, everything's hard for you. Courtney, that's not fair. She heads back to the car, stops. I'm happy for you, that's easy. She opens the door. Take care of yourself. Tell your dad I said hi, okay? Living room. Keith carries the box inside and shuts the door. Carol. Who was that? Keith. Courtney. He walks down the hall. She says, fuck you. Bedroom. Keith sets the box on his bed. Carol comes to the door. Courtney? Keith stares at his dad. Can I get some privacy? Keith shuts the door. He turns on the stereo and sits down on his bed. Ignoring the letter, he rifles through the box. It's full of old copies of Maximum Rock and Roll, Thrasher, show posters and sketches. There are also a few photos of Keith as a teenager on a homemade quarter pipe. Keith pushes the box aside and stands. He exits the room. Living room. Carol's reading in a chair by the window. Keith walks to the kitchen. So, Keith stops in the doorway. Carol stares at Keith incredulously. She brought me a box. Carol. What was inside? Keith. Things from our house. Carol. Did she say anything? She said hi. She said hi to me and hi to you. She said she was happy the bracelet's coming off and she gave me a letter. Carol, did you read it? Keith, no. Carol stares at Keith. Why? Keith shrugs and enters the kitchen. You aren't curious what it says? I can guess. Keith goes back into his bedroom. He grabs a photo of himself out of the box. He tacks it to one of the empty squares of wall behind his bed. Then he lies down and shuts his eyes. And this is a cut, a passage of time. Exterior, Keith jogs south along Broning Highway, heading in the direction of the Chesapeake Bay. A sound barrier stretching out like a monumental wall on Keith's right shields the neighborhood from the train tracks and the traffic on 695. Keith passes Methodist and Gospel Tabernacle churches, the town hall, and a community garden before reaching a split at New Pittsburgh Avenue. Keith keeps straight at the fork and follows Main Street toward the Francis Scott Key Bridge and Turner Station. Keith jogs through the meadows, The buildings there are mostly brown brick, two-story apartments on swaths of grass that once were wetlands. Women hang, hang laundry on clotheslines and long yards set back from the road. Kids splash in above ground swimming pools. Teens play basketball. Men wash their cars, mow lawns, or gossip. An old couple waits for the bus. A group of eight-year-olds chase Keith for a few yards, laughing. Keith turns under 695 and follows the Francis Scott Key Bridge towards Clement Cove. The service road that borders the bay is all gravel and weeds. Most of the properties along the water have old boats tied up in their grassy backyards. Two discarded mattresses block the path. Keith runs around them. He jogs past pensioners fishing off the pilings beneath the bridge and a couple on the pier, a group of young men riding ATVs, all the free world. At the basketball court, Keith stops to catch his breath. He watches some 15-year-old boys play a game of pickup. Thanks. <laughs>